Okay. I like uh, I like praising God. I like putting emotion into it. Look, if you love the Lord, uh, tell your tell your nerve endings, <laughs> tell your glands, tell your uh, your uh, uh, what do you call it? Tell your adrenaline gland. And uh, so, all right, let's take our Bibles and turn, if you would, please, to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter eleven. Matthew chapter eleven. Matthew chapter 11, we're going to read uh, just probably four verses, that looks like, uh, beginning with verse 16, and we'll read through verse 19. Matthew eleven, sixteen 16 through 19. But whereunto shall I liken this generation, by the way, this is Jesus talking, whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, we have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, He hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Just the opposite. Eating and drinking, and they say, Behold a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. That's, they're saying that scornfully. Behold a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. That's just another word of saying, you shall know their fruit by their, you shall know their, them by their fruits, okay? Or by their fruit. So wisdom is justified of her children. So wise people will do things and live in a certain way where the results will be the children that comes. Like I, I say this all the time, anytime you have a problem, you have a sin, it gets what's going to have babies. Uh, if a false doctrine comes in a church, it's going to have babies. See? Because everything produces something. See? Uh, every action has an opposite and equal reaction. So, and the reaction is the baby of the action. So, uh, anyway, but I want to I use this as a, as a launching pad to teach something and preach something very, very important. If we're not careful, the more we love God and the more we learn the Bible, the easier it is to forget what we used to be and how dumb we used to be and the mistakes we used to know, ha have and make. And uh, it's be, it'd be easier to criticize people that are not like us at our level when we forgot it took us 20 years to get where we're at or 10 years or 5 years and then some new person comes to church and we say, hey, man, get with the stuff. You know, we, you shouldn't be th doing this. You shouldn't be this way. Or you should be doing this. So look, folks, we've got to let people grow. That's what's wrong in churches a lot of times, especially, especially the ones that are stronger in faith, is they forget to let the new people take as much time as they took to grow. So uh, does that mean if people can't come to church unless they're fully grown? No, we've got to have babies. Got to have babies. Got to have new blood. And guess what? Babies sometimes mess their pants. <laughs> sometimes they make a mess. Sometimes they burp. And, uh, and, and new Christians, folks have just been saved. Or even someone who comes in is an unbeliever. And uh, they may say something we don't approve of. That doesn't mean we cast them out. Get out of here. We don't talk like that around here. Now, I'm going to show you some, one of the errors in our churches nowadays in the effort to be pure and holy. Look, you're pure and holy in the sight of God. Your flesh is not pure and holy. You should be trying to discipline your flesh where you are, but you're going to have problems. There's not a single person here today has not already sinned multiple times today. Not a single one. So, shall we have open confession and come up and have everybody one by one name the sins you've done? Somebody might have to kick you out. No, we wouldn't, but, but some churches would kick you out just from your own testimony. So what I want to do is I want to teach you what is the proper balance, what a church should be like, and what we're supposed to be like. So here's the example. God sent John the Baptist, and he went out, and Jesus, Jesus says, this generation is like children sitting in the markets calling to the fellows. We have piped you not dance. Why? Because the world wants you to be like them. The world wants you to dance to their tune, but we're not going to. We're going to follow God. We're going to follow the Lord. And uh, 
So Jesus explains in verse 18, John, talking about John the Baptist, came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber and so forth. Now, what he's saying here is that you can't win. You can't win with the world. And with some people, you just cannot win. You, 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 you yield to their criticism and trying to make yourself like them, acceptable to them, and guess what? They're going to find something else. You'll never make everybody happy. What's that old saying go? You can't please everybody all the time, but you can't please some people some of the time. But my job, let me tell you something, my job is not to please anybody. And your job shouldn't be to please anybody. Our job is to please God. Amen. Have faith in Him and do our best to do what He wants to do. When we fail, God is pleased when we put our faith in Him to, to confess our sins and He's faithful to forgive us. And that's the way you're supposed to live. That's why the, the Christian life is like this. It's a roller coaster. You get right, you, 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 you get down, you say, oh, I'm, I've done some bad things. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. You're down in the dumps. And you call for mercy. And he gives you mercy. He forgives you. And he gives you that joy that comes from knowing your sins are forgiven. Now you're on the mountaintop. But you don't go, we don't live on the mountaintop very well. Why? Because we're sinners. We've got that old nature. In our flesh dwells no good thing. It's not long before we find ourselves going downhill. Now sometimes if you can catch, if you notice you're going down, you can say, oh Lord, I feel like I've gone astray. Oh Lord, I want to be, and you can get right back up pretty quick. Some folks wait till they get all the way, they wait till they hit bottom. And so their life is like this. Let me tell you, the secret of Christian life is be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and His convincing you of sin in your life. When it's just starting to, so you can be like this instead of like this. Or you can go longer, and it takes longer to go down, and you don't go down as far as you used to. But every once in a while, you can take one of these. But you want to get to where you go like that in life. Now, that's the way it is because we have an old nature. And none of us can control our old nature all the time. See, the Bible says the tongue can no man tame. No man. And most of our sins are because of the tongue. Either we're using our tongue wrongly or we're listening to someone using their tongue wrongly. The tongue can no man tame. And by the way, he goes on and says, if you can tame the tongue, you can tame the whole body. I'll give you a little secret. You learn to control your tongue. You learn to control what you listen to, what you let in your ears and what you let out of your mouth. And you'll find that you're going to have more victory over other things. You're going to have more, more victory over where your feet go. You can have more victory about what your hands do. Ah, I'm going to hit, hit that man because I, he looked at me cross-eyed. You're going to get victory. If you control your tongue, you're going to control your fist, your hands. You control your eyes, what you look at, and your ears. You can have better control. The best secret to self-discipline self is learn to discipline that tongue. Hold back. Don't just spout out. Better mean what you say before you say it. But you better make sure your heart's right with God before you say something so you can mean what's good and right and not wrong. Some people say, I hate you, and they mean it. I'm not talking about that. I mean, get your heart right where you choose to love them because God does. You choose them because God's chosen them. Doesn't want them to go to hell. God wants everybody to get right with Him. So you decide that. And that'll help you not be so judgmental of other people. Control, your, control that tongue. All right, anyway, so... So that's what the world was. The world wants us to, pipe, to, to dance to their tune or to cry about what they cry about, complain about what they complain about. And no matter what you do, they're going to criticize you, whether you come eating and drinking or not. Now, let's focus on Jesus because he's our pattern, right? The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. Now, first of all, let's, let's deal, let me deal with this first. And I, I sh probably should not take too much time on this, but if a person's going around eating and drinking with people, for example, if I go, vi uh, when we go sewing, I mean, it happened to Brother Garrett and I, someone offered us uh, a, a bottle of water. And uh, almost every time I go sewing, I get a free bottle of water. Because <laughs> there's people out there that know enough Bible, or at least they're th hospitable and thoughtful and aware of being Arizona. They're the hell, it's hot out there. Would you like some water? And it's, it's, it's common now. It's, and it's not everybody, but at least every day, 
I go so many, somebody offers me a water, most, most of the time, not every day, but most of the time. And it did just recently. But, but there was a day in the old days when people were even more hospital than now. Would you say America is, is, is more hospital now than it was 50 years ago or less? Way less. So imagine what it was like in Jesus' day when they didn't have television. I mean, when someone came to your door, it's like, hey, mom, we got company. I remember that as a little kid. And someone would come to the door, and I'd go to the door and say, hey, mom, we got company. Or, hey, dad, somebody's here. We were glad to have somebody come here. Why? We're tired, tired of each other. No, not really. Um, but, but it's just good to have a change of pace, right? And so a visitor was always like, yay, we got a visitor. It's a good thing. Nowadays, folks are not that way. So guess what? In the old days, not only did they give water, but they'd wash someone's feet because they wore sandals mostly out in the Middle East. They wore sandals a lot. And so your feet get all dusty. So they'd bring out a, a bowl of water and a towel, and they'd wash your feet, and it'd cool your feet down and refreshing. And uh, maybe you got a sticker in there, uh, and your foot was bleeding. It washes the blood off, off the scab or whatever. And, and it's just they would refresh you, and then they'd bring out, would you like something to eat? Surely you need some, some nutrition, some fuel to, before you go back out. And it, it didn't mean they'd feast. But, you know, you go house to house and people offer you that all the time. Guess what? People can get the idea. Oh, boy, he's eating a lot. Now, do you think Jesus was a glutton? No. I don't think he was. I think he offered, oh, I think he was offered a lot. And so those that sit back and criticize, oh, he's a gluttonous. No, because they don't know behind closed doors. He said, no, thanks. Your neighbor was, gave me something. And I appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you for that. But... Uh, but I, I'm, I'm fine. Thank you so much. I'm sure that's what he did. I mean, that's what I do when someone comes and offers me. Look, if I ate everything and drank everything people offered, I'd be much bigger. <laughs> and by the way, there are preachers that are that way. Yeah. I mean, they, they have to preach for the public like this. That's all the closer they can get. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, they, they're, they're already bumping into it. See? So... Uh, <laughs> They can't control their tongue in a different way of control, different use of the tongue. Uh, they like anything that tastes good. They want to swallow. By the way, I was telling my wife, it'd be nice. Just yesterday I said to her, I, I was working outside doing some, some labor in the, in the sun, worked about six, seven hours in the sun yesterday and here on the property. And, and, uh, and uh, I said, I came in to get a drink of water. And when I got done, I put the glass down. I said, man. I sure say there's a way to get that feeling of drinking cold water and keeping that feeling without drowning or filling up. That is, you know, that's like one of the best feelings in the world. When you're drinking cold water and you've been hot and tired and it's going down and it's filling your throat, that is one of the best feelings. But you know what? A lot of folks, they eat for that feeling. They don't eat because they're hungry. They eat because, oh, man, that tastes good. I want more and more and more. Kind of like I have to work at not doing with chips. You know, can't eat just one. <laughs> uh, and by that, I mean bag. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, we like that. So guess what? It's easy for us to become gluttonous because we like, we live in the flesh and the flesh says. But Jesus wasn't, wasn't that way. It's just that he could be misconstrued. So the people will criticize you no matter what you do. But you control yourself. You control your passions. You control your, your, your desires, physical and emotional and whatever. You control all your desires under the leadership and the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, so they said a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. I'm sure people offered him wine all the time. By the way, wine in the Bible is not, is not distinguished, in the Word, does not distinguish whether it's fermented or not. It's both. It can be both. But you can always tell by context. See? All right, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Is it 20? Yeah, 20, verse 1. It says, wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging. No, well, strong drink, right? Yeah. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. All right, so wine is a mocker. I love grape juice. I had some Welch's grape juice. You know what? It didn't, nothing happened to me that I didn't all of a sudden change from drinking grape juice and people start mocking me. It didn't make a fool out of me. 
it made my tongue rejoice. <laughs> it made my heart glad, see? Like the Bible says in Proverbs, and a wine that maketh glad the heart of man. It's like a good cold drink of water. A drink of grape juice is so good. Oh, the sour and the sweet, it's just perfect. To me, grape juice is the best juice in the world. It's my favorite, especially freshly squeezed Concord grapes. Nothing in the world better. Now, I can't drink it all day. Why? You don't, I don't want to. That kind of drink is the drink is the kind that I sip. I don't just, go, 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 go. I don't do a 12-ounce glass of, of Walter's grape juice. No, I sip it. It's just too good to gulp down. I want my tongue to feel every, every molecule of that grape juice before it goes down my throat. It is that good. See? And it rejoices my heart. It doesn't make a mock of me. It doesn't deceive me. But you let that stuff rot and ferment, and it changes. And now it can affect your mind. It can affect your body. It can make you giddy and silly, where you say things and people laugh at you. Like we used to have a man in the neighborhood, we called him Wino. We never knew his name. He was just the Wino, the neighborhood drunk. And uh, I remember my brother seeing one time we were playing basketball, and he came walking down, stumbling down the road, you know, like drunk people do, and staggering. And, and one of my brothers got an idea, and we knew that was wrong to get drunk. And so we knew something was wrong with that. And so, but we're young and immature. And one of my older brothers said, hey, let's have some fun with the wino. Hey, wino, want to play basketball? And they threw the basketball at him, or to him. But no, I said it right. They threw it at him because he was not capable of catching it. And they knew it, and they wanted to laugh at that. And so they mocked the guy. I was like five years old when this happened. That was stuck in my mind. Now, should they have done that? No, they shouldn't have done that. But I'm glad they did because that gave me a memory to prove what the Bible teaches. Wine is a mocker. Obviously, that's a different kind of wine. That's strong. That's, that's fermented wine. And it changes properties. It's not the way God made it. That's what happens when... You know, fermentation is, is, is illustrated in the Bible as sin. And so, anyway, so Jesus is accused of being a wine bibber, a guy who, and by the way, wine connoisseurs, even fermented wine, they like to taste the difference, and so they, but they accuse Jesus of being a wine bibber while he's going to house to house. They don't see what happens. They don't see that Jesus says, oh, is that fresh? Oh, thank you. How old is that? No, no, no thanks. See? They don't, they don't know that. Just like they don't know whether he eats and swallows everything they offer him. And he's not really a glutton. But I, I, I know Jesus is not a glutton. And I know Jesus is not a drunkard. And I know he never drank fermented wine. And uh, I'm not going to prove that because the sermon's not about that. I'm just saying this is what happens. There are people who make accusations. And they accuse him of being a gluttonous man and a wine bibber. But then look what else. A friend of publicans and sinners. I'll do the one at a time, but not too long on publicans. What's a publican? Tax collector. Anybody here love tax collectors? Anybody here love the IRS? <laughs> Nobody here work, work for them? <laughs> okay. All right. No, we don't like the IRS. All right. Number one, they, they, they deceive the American people. They're part of a deception. Now, by the way, I'm not against the IRS. I am not against them. I'm against the way they enforce things and apply things to people to whom they do not apply. I'm for anybody that goes into public service, any government employee. I'm for them being some of their money taken out so they can have Social Security later on, so they don't become dependent upon us. I want some of their pay to be taken out to help care for them. They, it's, it's actually good. It's good that they take care of themselves. Um, I don't like it when they require people to, who, who do not work for the government. I like it when foreigners, aliens, a lien is put on them when they make money in our country. I like that. They shouldn't use our resources and get rich and not contribute. So there should be a lien. They should pay a tax because they're not, they're not of us. They're foreigners, and they're coming to our country. They should be welcome, and they shouldn't get freebies. They should work hard, make money. But yet, because they're making money here, they should pay a tax. I'm for that. It's only just, it's only fair. So it won't be fair if I go to Mexico. I don't have a right to go to Mexico or Ecuador or Chile or Brazil and make money and not contribute to the country that gave me that ability to do so. So they have a right to tax me if I go there. 
anyway, um, but I should be able to, f should be free to go wherever I need to. Um, it's called sojourning in the Bible. Anyway, so I'm not going to spend any more time, but the publicans were tax collectors, and they were under Roman rule at this point, and tax collectors sometimes would, ta would charge more than they're, than they're allowed, and they'd use the authority, because the Roman government was behind them, they'd use that to extract from the people what they weren't supposed to extract. And so the, they were hated. And so this is a derogatory thing. He's a friend of publicans, friend of tax collectors. And then they said, and sinners. He's a friend of sinners. A friend of sinners. Well, this is one thing that's actually true. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And Jesus is a friend to us. God had goodwill. Those angels cried and, and sang from heaven to the shepherds and said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth goodwill toward men. God has goodwill towards sinful man. God sees all our sin, but he's got goodwill. He says, hey, I'm the land slave from the foundation of the world. I got goodwill for you. I've got a will. My will is not that you go to hell forever. My will is that you believe in the payment I'm going to make for your sins. And you trust me as Savior. And if you believe in me, I'll forgive your sins and save your soul so you can spend eternity with me instead of in hell. Jesus suffered hell for us so that he could offer us the gift of eternal life. He's a friend to sinners. So there, that one, yeah, that's true. He is a friend of sinners, and he ought to be, because sinners need a friend. Amen. You needed a friend. I needed a friend. We're all sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, Paul said. And Romans 5.12, one of your memory verses Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. But another one we're going to do next month is Romans 5, 8. That God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not after we got better and got victory over sin. No, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we go soaring this afternoon. We're going, to, we're going to go soaring and give the gospel to sinners. And we want to tell them about a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Because a brother can't live inside you, but he can. <laughs> and he'll stick. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's that friend that Proverbs talks about that sticketh closer than a brother. Anyway, so Jesus is a friend of sinners. All right, so if Jesus is a friend of sinners, if we're going to be Christ-like, then shouldn't we be friends of sinners? Now, what does it mean to be a friend of sinners? Does Jesus, is he Jesus a friend of sinners where he goes in, into someone's house and says, Oh, hey, you're having a party? Oh, what kind of wine you got? Oh, that's alcohol. All right, it don't matter. Yes, wine's wine. I made it all. Yeah, here, let me drink up with you. You think he did that? No way in the world. He is separate from sinners, the Bible says. He was separate from sinners. In other words, he, had, he loved the sinners. He'd go to help them, but he would separate from them and that he wouldn't participate in their sin. And we're not supposed to participate in anybody's sin, but we're supposed to go to them and tell them that the answer is Jesus for their sin, and they can get forgiveness. So we're supposed to be a friend to them in that we go to them to give them the gospel, but we're not supposed to go to them and hang around and do what they do and participate in all they participate in. So I'll go to someone's birthday party, but not if they're serving alcohol alcoholic beverages. If it's clean and they don't have serve alcohol, yeah, I'll attend. If I find out they're serving alcohol, I don't even go. I won't go to someone's wedding if they're going to serve alcoholic beverage. I'm say, sorry. Uh, hope you have a good marriage. Hope that all goes well. But I don't need to go and celebrate with people that are drinking like that. I just don't. So, um, why? Because I want to separate myself from sinners. But I'll be a friend to them. I'll say, look, if you'll serve something else, I'll be glad to come and be with you. Um, so, anyway. Um, now. Let's go to Luke chapter 7. Let me show you a proof. And we looked at this reading recently, so, but let's, let's go to Luke chapter 7 and show you proof that Jesus is a friend of sinners. And it doesn't matter how bad of a sinner you are, by the way. Luke chapter 7. And we'll start with verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. That's what, that's what they do. It's just a hospitable thing to do. 
And, uh, but we know he didn't eat everything. We know he was not a glutton. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. And when you think of a woman in a city that is a sinner, well, aren't all women sinners? Aren't all men sinners? Yeah, but this woman was known as a sinner. Her reputation was in the city as being a sinner. And this Pharisee knew, oh, that woman's a sinner. So probably, my guess is this woman was a prostitute, a known prostitute. But she comes in when she knew that Jesus had a meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. She's a prostitute. She's going to have ointment. She's going to have expensive perfume. That's part of her trade. Verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. Now, why would she do that? Why would she come in to some stranger's house because Jesus is there? Why would she do that? Because she heard about Jesus. She learned who Jesus was. Jesus was the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the one that God had promised that would come and, and, and be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, to take away our sins. And she knew she was a sinner. She knew how bad of a sinner she was. She knew that everybody in the city knew that she was a sinner. She hadn't been to hide hers. She had to make her living off of it. And she knew it was wrong. And she knew who he was. And what he came to do. So she stood, stands behind him, weeping. And began, after a while, she knelt down and began to wash his feet with tears. She didn't come in with water, but she washes his feet with tears, which is mostly water. And began, anyway, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. She didn't plan this. She just heard, I heard Jesus going there. And she just had to see him. And she, she comes in, and it hits her, hits her who, she, who he is. She begins to weep that this man is going to die for her sins. That this is God made flesh, and, and he's going to die for her sins and pay her what she owes. She began to weep. And she knelt down and let her tears fall on his feet and took her hair. She washed his feet, rubbed, rubbed the tears and spread it and washed all the dirt off and cried some more and washed some more uh, and rinsed it some more off and, and just kept weeping and weeping. Then she dried his feet with her hairs and kissed his feet. These are the feet of the man who's going to pay for my sins. And anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had hidden him saw it, he spake within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. She, he's, he's looking at her like a, someone who thinks he's better. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee, because Jesus knows his heart. He's God. He knows what's going on in his mind. And he saith, Master, say on. So Jesus tells a story. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And I know I preached on this recently. Was it last Sunday? I don't know. Or was it Wednesday? Anyway, it doesn't hurt to hear it again. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he, I remember now preaching on this last week. Uh, but, it's, but it's an illustration that I needed for the, today's message too. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. One of my favorite statements in the Bible. Thy sins are forgiven. If he'd do that to her, he'd do it for me, wouldn't he? God's no respect of persons. And guess what? If you look to Christ and trust in Him and know who He is and believe on Him, He'll say to you, Thy sins are forgiven. If you believe it, it'll give you great joy. It'll take the tears away. That might cause a few more, but there'll be tears of joy, tears of gratitude. 
Thy sins are forgiven. Wonderful. And when they sat at, they, they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? I'll tell you who it is. It's God. God made flesh. Amen. And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Oh, she got her sins forgiven, and she saved. God saved her soul as well. So, what does this prove? It proves that Jesus loves sinners. And this is what we want to go out and do this afternoon. Any time we get a chance, opportunity, is to give the gospel to people, the good news that God loves sinners. So that means we have to love them too. We can't say, oh, that guy's a drunk. I'm going to stay away from him. No, give him the gospel. That doesn't mean go drink with him. It doesn't mean go, go do what he does and hang out with him and socialize. Give him the gospel. Look, I don't socialize with anybody. I either give the gospel or I have good Christian fellowship. So I, that's the only socializing I do. But I don't see socializing in the Bible. I just have fellowship. See, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, with His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? So, anyway, so we're supposed to win the sinners to Christ. And we have to go talk to them. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We'll see another example. Luke chapter 8 and verse 1. Oh, yeah, we'll just keep on going. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings. That's good news. That's the gospel. Showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. Why? He's training them, teaching them how to go soul winning. And winning people to Christ, to the gospel, through the gospel. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others which ministered in him of their substance. So the disciples were with him, but also were these women, one of whom was Mary Magdalene, who had seven devils living. I wonder how she lived. I wonder what her lifestyle was like. I wonder what kind of sin she committed when she had seven devils living inside of her. Must have been pretty wicked. But yet Jesus won her to himself. Jesus saved her soul. Look, we want to be like Jesus, not like the Pharisee. I want 35th Avenue Baptist Church to be like Jesus, not like the Pharisees. There are Pharisees that won't have anything to do with someone who lives in a way that's obvious, oh, he's a sinner, she's a sinner. And they separate. Now, was Jesus separate from sinners? Yes, but he went to them. He didn't participate in their sin, but he went to them. He loved them. He cared for them. And he preached the truth to them. And he would save them if they'd believe in him. And that's what we should do. So, what is Jesus doing? He's taking sinners who understand who he is. He's forgiving their sins. Turning them into grateful, joyful, thankful, humble People who love him and now follow him. Because not only these disciples with Jesus while he's preaching, but women are with him as well. And going soul winning too, probably. And at least taking care of fixing food for the soul winners that are going to go out. They're serving, see. And so, what's God's doing? I'll tell you what God's doing. He's recycling them. He's recycling them. See. We, 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 we get a bunch of garbage, don't we, sometimes, in our homes. And so we've learned, instead of filling up our, 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 um, our uh, uh, landfills and, and dumps, instead of filling with all this stuff, we can re some that we can recycle. I've got, we picked a bunch of nails from work we've been doing, and I picked up with a magnet. And I went in there, and I slid them off that magnet bar into a bucket where I'm keeping metal. Instead of throwing in the garbage... I've got a bucket of metal, and every once in a while I take it down to a recycler, and I get some money back. I recycle it. Why? They're going to take that, they're going to melt it down, and they're going to make it, melt it down, and purify it, and make new clean metal out of it. Because there's clean metal, and there's just a bunch of dirt and rust mixed in with it. And paint, and paper, and plastic, and other stuff attached to it. But you're going to recycle it. Let me tell you something, folks. That's what we're supposed to be. 
God is a recycler. He, we're, we're just a bunch of sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one, but God takes sinners and he wants to recycle you. He wants to purify you. And he wants to melt you and mold you into a new creature. Into someone who's disciplined, who will serve him and who will do good and, and do good to other people and be, be a friend to people and be a friend to sinners and bring them to Christ. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be recyclers. Our church has been called a trash can church recently. <laughs> trash can church. And, and it's done in a derogatory term. I'll embrace that. Yeah, give us your trash. People you don't like because they don't agree with you. Hey, give us. Yeah, come on, trashy people. Come on over. If someone calls you trashy, just come on over. We know how to clean you up. And by the way, someone might be lying about you. There might be some good folks out there being treated like trash. Look, you, you go to these ritzy folks, these arrogant, proud people, and, uh, oh, this is, this is trash, and it's perfectly good. Man, I, you know, I go to the dumps every once in a while and dump stuff from the church, and uh, that we're not going to recycle and don't have time to or whatever. And, man, when I go there every time, man, I, w I feel like I could load the truck up or the trailer up with good stuff. I see stuff in there fixable. And some stuff wouldn't even need to be fixed. Just wash it off a little bit. And it worked fine. But you're not allowed to do that. You know why? Because City of Phoenix is a corporation. They're in to make money. They don't want you taking good stuff and making They want to do it and make money out of it. Or they'll just melt it down or, or whatever. But, but, the, but they have the recycling business. You know, you know, we shouldn't be recycling to the City of Phoenix. We should recycle ourselves if we're smart. If people are smart, start your own recycling business, you know, and be recyclers. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. But that's what a church is. What? How is God going to populate heaven? With sinners who've been saved. There's not one single person who has not sinned that's going to go to heaven. Not one man. Of course, there's none righteous. There's not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So everybody that's going to go to heaven is going to be some has been recycled. Everybody. Even those that say, you're a trash can church. <laughs> Man, I've never been so complimented. <laughs> Look, bring me all your trash. I wish, I wish every church would send their trash here. I know people are going to say, yeah, but well, what about the pedophiles and all that? Well, you don't, like I said earlier, in the earlier hour Bible study, you don't know who a pedophile is. You don't know who a pervert is. You can't tell them by looking. Sometimes you can think you do. But you know, there's some people who've been made fun of as little boys. Or little girls because they're like tomboyish, made fun of. And the world is so cruel that sometimes the world pushes them to where they become what they're accused of when they weren't. Well, I may as well do the thing they're accusing me of. And they haven't done it yet. That's why, it's that's why the tongue is set on fire of hell. The devil's trying to make pedophiles out of people that wouldn't otherwise be. The, world's, the devil's trying to make the wicked perverts out of people that otherwise wouldn't be. So look, every one of us is a sinner, right? Every one of us could become a pervert if we, if we what is a pervert? A pervert uh, is, a, is, is a root word. It means truth. And pervert means to go around like perimeter. So a pervert is someone who knows the truth and avoids the truth, goes around it. Because they don't want to face the truth. So they go around it. That's what a pervert is. And every one of us has sin in our lives. And we know the truth of the word of God. And we, we hear the word of God. And we reject the word of God. You become a pervert to some degree. Every time you reject the word of God. And not everybody believes everything in this book. Not everybody complies. Their life complies with this book. So everybody's a pervert to some degree. Maybe, maybe that degree. And some people to this degree, and some people this degree. It doesn't matter how much you are. The fact is, will you ever acknowledge the truth? So look, I don't care who comes here. We don't have a sign out there, uh, if you're this, 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 you're not welcome. No. We're going to take everybody on face value. We're going to trust, we're going to show trust, but not trust everybody. But we're going to show trust. We're going to act like we trust everybody. In other words, we're going to, no, I don't mean act, I mean, we're going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt because you don't know. Why? Because actions is what matters. That's why we want you parents to have your children with you, not in some room. 
with some nursery workers that who knows could be a pervert. They got your child all by themselves somewhere at some point. Oh, you miss pants, got to take the bathroom and clean them up and whatever. Let the parents do that. Yeah, See, let the parents do that. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so yeah, send your trash here. We're going to go out and we're going to go slowly and we're going to knock on some pretty trashy doors today. Behind those doors, every door we knock on, there's going to be a trashy person. Because we're all trash. I like what Proverbs says. Uh, it is not, it is not, saith the buyer to the seller. But when he's gone his way, then he rejoiceth. He goes to the, to the, to the, dump, the city dump or the uh, salvage yard. By the way, I like that term, salvage yard. Yeah. I like salvage yards better than dumps. Dumps are like too close to the word Dan. D-U-M, D-A-M, and, and so forth. Anyway, I like salvage yard. Because that's what God is. He's a salvager. That same root word is salvation. God came to save holy people? No. Did God come to save the righteous? No. There is none righteous. No, not one. God came to, came to save sinners. He came to salvage people. And we should be in the salvaging business, which means we're in the trash business. That's what we're in. But not just trash to throw it away and burn it. That's what the devil does. He just take people and get them deeper into sin. Deep. No, we want to try to pull them out of sin. And get them to quit sinning as much. And, and discipline themselves so they don't sin as much. Now, we'll never get them totally out of sin. But we're going to work on them and teach the Word of God so they can sin less. Why? Because we want to recycle them. That's what we're reading. The recycling business, not the dump business. Yeah. I'm not the kind of preacher that's going to dump somebody and say, All right, get out of here. We don't want you here anymore. Unless you're trying to undermine. See? I've never thrown anybody out of this church because of some sin in their life. Because I've never had anybody that had sin in their life that didn't repent and wasn't sorry and, 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 and wasn't asking picture. I, I, I sure wish I could do better. So I don't throw them out because they did a certain sin. Like some preachers do. As long as they, are, they admit their fault. Man, can you imagine? Jesus said, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He didn't say, he, come, he that cometh to me that hasn't done certain sins, I'll accept if you haven't done certain No. Him that cometh to me, and no list of exceptions, I shall in no wise cast out. See, he's in the recycling business. And you know, he's a better recycler than us. He can recycle anybody. Even a woman that had seven devils in her. Even a prostitute that's known for being a prostitute. So much so that the, the, that the, 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 the host there said, if this man, this man can't be a prophet, he thought this in his mind about Jesus. Because if he was a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this was. He wouldn't be here. He wouldn't, he wouldn't put up with her even touching him. Reminds me, I love this story about Brother Howes. Came home to visit his mother. He used to do that before she died every Thursday. And he'd go sewing on Thursday mornings. And he'd go meet his mother at 1 o'clock. And one day, while out sewing, he came across a woman that actually admitted to being a prostitute. But she knew it was wrong. And he gave her the gospel. And she trusted Christ as her Savior. That's the first time he'd ever won a prostitute to the Lord in his life that he could think of. And and so he has done, and done so many, when he got done sewing so that, that morning, he went to his, to his mother's house. He said, Mama, you won't believe it. Oh, God blessed and so many today. Had a great time. And Mama, guess what? I got to lead a prostitute to the Lord. And she said, you didn't talk to her, did you? <laughs> that old-fashioned, old, you know, old, old school, you know, don't talk to prostitutes. But of course he had to, to win her to Christ. Amen? So, look, we need to get that attitude where we're not afraid to talk to anybody. I don't care if he's a drug addict, a drunkard. I don't care if he's a prostitute, uh, she's a prostitute, or he's a pimp. Look, pimps are in it for the money. They got in it somehow. Somebody got something in their head to make money. And here's an easy way they didn't care. They didn't have much scruples. Why did they have scruples? Didn't have much scruples. Maybe they weren't brought up in the Word of God. And somebody needs to show them the Word of God and tell them, hey, that's wicked. That's sinful. I mean, would you want to be sold like this? Would you be, want someone to control you like you're controlling these people? They need to be shown and, awake and, 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 and be made aware of the wickedness of what they're doing. So the Holy Spirit can convince them. And then once we convince them of sin, 
We give them the answer. We recycle them. If they receive it, great. If they don't, well, we're not going to fellowship with them. People that reject the gospel, I'm not going to keep hanging around them. I'm not going to. They're going a different way, so I'm not going to hang around them. Now, I may try again after a while, giving them time to think about it, the Holy Spirit work on them through the word I planted already in their heart, but I'm not going to socialize with them. See? But I am in the recycling business. All right, did we go to Luke 22 yet? Let's go to Luke 22. I don't think so. So Jesus is in the recycling business, and so should we be. And I'll wear that badge of trash can church with honor. Send me more trash. All right, Luke chapter 22. And verse, we'll start with the verse of 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art, what's the next word? Converted. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So when Jesus says, when thou art converted, do you think Peter's already converted? If he's already converted, then why would Jesus say, when thou art converted? As if it, to me it implies he's not been converted yet. Now, is he saved? Yes. Peter's already believed on the Lord. He's saved. See, saved and converted are not synonymous terms. We use them sloppily in our lingo, church lingo. Hey, when are you converted? A lot of times people testify, I got converted, you know, 30 years ago, and they're still not converted. What does it mean, convert? It means to change the use of something. Like after World War II, he took a bunch of the bombers that the, the, the Air Force had. Surplus. We're not in war anymore. The Constitution, according to the Constitution, is not supposed to have a standing army. So they converted a lot of the bombing planes into commercial jets. So, I mean, would you want a commercial jet flying? We're in the flight pattern. We don't want jets flying with carrying bombs. What if one fell off accidentally? So no, you convert them. You take the weapons off, you take the bombs off, and you make the interior nice for passengers, and you convert it for a different use. You don't send that plane off to bomb countries anymore. Well, we, still, we do nowadays, but that's a shame without a declaration of war. But anyway, but no, you convert the use of it. And so after you get saved, you need to get converted. There's a lot of folks that are saved but not converted. Peter was not converted yet. And so Jesus says... When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Which means he's not been strengthening the brethren. But there will be a time when he does. All right, so now look at verse 54. Oh, let, let, wait, let's finish. And he said unto him, Peter replied to the Lord, he said, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, now the Jesus responding, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. All right, now go to, uh, skip to verse 54. Not long after this, same night, Jesus is betrayed by uh, Judas, and he's arrested and taken in <coughs> for judgment. <coughs> Verse 54, then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them, but a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him. That was like, like, like seriously looking like, like you do when you see somebody and say, hmm, I think I know that guy. Let's see, where do I know that guy? I'm trying to figure out where you know that face from. So, she and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. It dawned her. This man was also with him. Jesus, the one that's been arrested. And he denied, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, and he denied him. Notice, denied Jesus. Uh, he denied him saying, woman, I know him not. Just like Jesus said he would. And after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. <laughs> he denied again, didn't he? And about the space of one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth, this fellow, and Peter overhears it, 
of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. The cock crew. Now, let's go to Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 and verse 66. Pretty much the same, same, same thing. And as Peter was beneath the, in, beneath in the palace, they took Jesus apparently to a, a, a higher room, a second story or something. There cometh one of the maids of the high priest, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also wast with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied, saying, I know not, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, This is one of them. And he denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeth thereto. Look at verse 71. And he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. Wow. That's pretty bad, isn't it? You think Peter needs to be converted? Do you think his speech needs to be converted? Do you think his language needs to be converted? His tongue? Yeah. And Jesus is in the conversion business. He's in the recycling business. He's in the trash purchasing business. So he can recycle and make good things out of, out of what he purchases. He purchased us with his blood. Who did he purchase? Sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. Alright, now go to... Mark chapter 16. I love this. <laughs> Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had... That makes me hungry. Like baloney. Uh, anyway, Salome. And <laughs> had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. So they just knew it had been sealed with a stone. And, uh, and they didn't really look. They just knew that it was. And so they wondered, Who's going to roll that stone away? And then they looked, saw it was rolled away. Verse 5, And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, I'm clothed in a white, long white garment. And, uh, <clears throat> and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Now, I don't think I read far enough in Luke. So before you, before I finish this, let's, let me jump back, jump back to Luke real quick, and uh, Luke 22, because I didn't read far enough. Because I want to show you something really interesting. Luke chapter 22, <coughs> and verse um, 61. This is after Jesus. Yeah, the cock crew is the last words of verse 60 and verse 61. And the Lord turned. And looked upon Peter. Think about that. Peter just said, Lord, I would die for you. And Jesus said, tonight you're going to deny me thrice. And he does, and he curses and swears. And then Jesus led from one place to another. And Jesus looked upon Peter. I bet their eyes locked. Can you imagine the guilt Peter must have felt. That's why it says that he went out and wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. Now let me tell you something. God is a friend of sinners. God is a recycler. Peter had a bunch of garbage and trash coming from his mouth. He's saved, but he's a backslidden Baptist. Denying the Lord, cursing and swearing that he ever knew him. Doesn't want to be associated. He's scared to death. It's under duress. So you'll do things under duress that you wouldn't otherwise do. And God understands that. And Jesus looked upon him. 
I'm sure Peter looked back and, oh, shame filled him. He went out and wept bitterly. Now, back to Mark 16. These women come, and they see a young man sitting on the right side, and they're affrighted. Verse 6, And he saith unto them, Be not affright, affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. By the way, is an angel, and angels do the bidding of God. Jesus is God. They're going to do what Jesus, he's going to say what Jesus wants them to say. He said, Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Now watch this. Here's what the angel goes, and he's instructed by God to do say so. And go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter <laughs> that he goeth before you into Galilee. He names Peter. You know why? God knows Peter is the one that's feeling the worst. By the way, the Bible says they all, all this time, they all forsook him. Apparently, John came back. It was by Mary, Jesus' mother. And Jesus spoke to John. But they all forsook him at one point or another. Because all means all. But Peter, he cursed and swore and denied the Lord. Just like Jesus said he would. It's bad enough that he did it, but you think, you don't, don't you think it's worse for Peter to know the Lord even foretold it and I didn't have the courage to not. He's really feeling bad. He's weeping bitterly. So what does Jesus do? He's comforting his heart. Jesus is going to recycle him. Jesus is going to recycle this cursor and swear and denier. <laughs> Man, doesn't that give you hope? There's hope. Jesus is our hope. My hope is in thee. So many times I wonder how God could use me. I just keep on getting in the way. <laughs> and just put myself in a position where God can use me. I don't deserve to be used with him, but he's a recycler. So he says, tell my disciples and Peter. <laughs> he didn't name John, who leaned on his breast. He didn't name Matthew, who gave up his tax collecting business to follow Jesus. He didn't name Bartholomew. He named Peter, because he knew Peter needed that encouragement. You need encouragement today? Oh, look to Jesus. He'll give it to you. Now turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we find something very interesting. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they waited 10 days like Jesus told them, or they tarried it, it turned out to be 10 days. They didn't know it would be that, but they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, there's dwelling in Jerusalem people from other countries that spoke other languages, so God filled them with the Spirit and gave them the ability to speak in other tongues that they did not know, unknown to them, not gibberish like the fake charismatic movement but in tongues that they did not know, that God knew people would understand that were there from other parts of the country because it's the it's day of Pentecost, a feast of Jews. So Jews from all over the world had come, and God knew it. And, uh, and so, look at verse 14. Notice they're all speaking, right? They're all speaking. They're all preaching. But Peter's sermon is the only one recorded. Verse 14, and Peter... Standing up with eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing as but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to preach. But Peter preaches that sermon, and when he gets done preaching, they said in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, notice that, to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, but focusing on Peter. Why? Because he's, he's got the main stage. And they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent, be baptized. See, God's using Peter. Why? Because God's a recycler. That's what he is. And that's what we're supposed to be. And that's what 35th Avenue Baptist Church is going to be as long as I'm pastor. We're going to recycle people. So yeah, send the trash. Let's go, let's go and win some trash to Christ. And let's bring them in. And let's teach them the word of God. Teach them to change their ways. Teach them to get converted and change the use of their body. The use of their tongues. It doesn't bother me if somebody gets saved and then uh, comes to church and says, says, Blanky, blank, that was good preaching. Not going to bother me at all. I'm not going to say, oh, you can't talk like that here. I'll just laugh and say, wow, boy, old habits die hard, don't they? 
Well, at least you like the good preaching. You recognize good preaching. Bless your heart. I hope you can clean up your language. I'm not going to say, we don't talk like that here. We're better than you. Get out. You know, look, the world is sick and tired of people who think they're better than they are. So let's just, like I preached last Sunday, let's realize we're sinners and we're chief of sinners. Think of yourself as being the worst sinner and then go out and try and reach somebody else. Salvage them. Let's be trash collectors and recyclers. I don't have time to, but I would if I had time. But I have limited time. I can't waste my time doing too much of it, but I'm a recycler physically. I want to be a recycler spiritually. And that means if someone in the church fails in some big way and commits some sin, sin that people on their list of these are worse than others, which we shouldn't be. Let me tell you something. Lying is just as bad as adultery. If not, actually it could be worse. It's, it's not, but, but it could be as far as man's concerned worse. Because you could do worse. You could hurt more people with the lie than you can with adultery. You only hurt one person or maybe family and so forth. Let me tell you something. Lies are just as bad. And all men are liars. We need to get, out, get away from this weighing different sins. It's all sin. Jesus died for all of our sins. Now, real quick, I, I, this brings up some questions. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 5, and I'll try to wrap this up quickly. 1 Corinthians 5. See, it's easy for preachers because, look, pr there's a desire in the heart of every, because we all have a na nature, a sinful nature. Even preachers have that sinful nature still. And sometimes it raises itself up through pride, and we cling to certain things in the Bible and preach because it's powerful. It makes you sound like a powerful, strong preacher. And, you know, who wants to be a weak preacher? I don't want to be a weak preacher. I want to be a strong preacher. But I don't want to be a mean preacher either. I want to have the heart of God. I want to have a tender heart towards those who are just, just like I would have been. Or, but by the grace of God, that's where I would be. So, anyway, 1 Corinthians 5. I've got to hurry if I may get to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and look at verse, uh, well, let's just do verse, start with verse 8. It is, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. This is to the church at Corinth. It's common. You get that? It is reported commonly that there is fornication. This is a carnal church. According to chapter 3, verse 3, you're yet carnal. See? All right? So, it is reported co commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not such so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. That's really bad. Okay? Now, verse 2 says, And you're puffed up, and, let's see, I turned to, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. See? We should, we should cry that God would take someone like that do something that bad. I didn't say every fornicator, but this particular one. Did so bad it's worse the Gentiles don't even do that. Alright? For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. By the way, it doesn't mean anybody commits fornication. We should mourn that God would take them away from us. No, because we're, we're, we're recyclers. Okay? We're supposed to take them and get them to confess and get right with God and go on. Alright? Now, but this guy is different. I mean, he's so bad. Anyway, so... So he says in verse, he says, verse 3, For I verily, as absent body, but present spirit, have judged already as though I were present, concerning him that hath done so done this deed. In the name, that is in the power and authority, of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, that is at church, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right, so deliver one over to Satan. Turn him over to the devil. Why? Because he's done a fleshly deed, and he's so bad, he's really corrupted in his mind. He's not seeking repentance or anything like that. So turn him over to the devil, and he'll continue to do those things till his flesh is consumed away and he's destroyed. But this is a believer. Why? It says that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You can do some pretty bad things and still go to heaven, folks. Because we're not saved by works. We're saved by the grace of God. But yet God wants to clean up a church from something this bad. 
Because when a person goes that bad, probably he's not going to, that's, that's really bad. Not much hope for someone like that. All right, now, verse 6, it says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump? See, these people are glorying. Oh, this person's saved and he's done a wicked thing. You know, we shouldn't glory in the sins that other people do. You know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be bringing up people saying, Oh, God saved me from a life of drugs and, 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 and broadcast that. No, just say, God saved me. Now, if a person wants to give their testimony in private to people, say, yeah, I was, but you know, not the whole church. Little kids don't need to learn about that. You don't need prostitutes getting up from the front of the church with the children there saying, yeah, I used to uh, sleep out on Van Buren and, 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 and sleep with men, different men every night, and sometimes three or four men in a night. And we don't need those testimonies. We don't need to glory in that way. Let's glory in the cross. Let's glory in the blood of the cross. Let's glory in Christ, not the sins that people got saved from. Let's praise God and let's preach the truth that God can save anybody, no matter what sin they did, but let's not glory in their sin. I've seen a lot of that. So, verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, for ye are un, for year unleavened. For even Christ our pastor is sacrificed. Now, here's what I'm going to show you. Here's what people say. They say, see, purge out the old leaven, so throw them out. It says, turn them over to Satan. Didn't say throw them out. If you turn them over to Satan, guess what? Is Satan's going to want him to come to church? No, he's probably not. He's going to quit on his own. No, I've never had to throw anybody out of church for sin. Number one, I've never known anybody to do anything that would warrant it, number one. And number two, I've never known anybody that did something that did not repent. But number two, I have people, have people who came here. I suspicion they weren't living clean lives. And guess what? I just preached hard and they left on their own. Yeah. See? And we don't do any glorying over sin here. I just preached hard. Now, so purge out, but look what it says. Here's what we forget. Are we all sinners? Yeah. Right. Do we all have leaven in us? Yeah. yeah, we are. But yet he says, you're unleavened. He's talking about the spirit. Ye, as children of God, are unleavened. But in the flesh, yeah, you got some leaven. So what does he say? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. What's old leaven? It's the opposite of new leaven. What's new leaven? New leaven is what you did this morning, since you were here Wednesday night, or what you did Thursday or Friday or Saturday, the sins you committed since you last confessed your sins and got right with God. Some folks don't confess. They don't get right with God. They don't get clean. Guess what? They got old leaven. They're harboring sin. They're not acknowledging their sin. It's building up. He says, purge out the old leaven. He didn't say purge out all the leaven. Purge out the old leaven. They may be a new lump. Why? Because His mercies are new every morning. Every time I walk in this pulpit, I'm a new lump. Because I just freshly confess my sins before I come in here. To preach. Sometimes I have to do it while I'm singing. Sometimes I have to do it while I'm preaching. This flesh is so bad, sometimes a thought can come to my head while I'm preaching. See? And same with you while you're sitting in the pew. Your mind can daydream, and all of a sudden you're imagining things that are wicked. You need to get a new lump. You can become a new lump anytime you go to the Lord and confess your sins. He's faithful. And just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And you become a new lump. You become unleavened again. So, so look, the bottom line is this. Romans 1.16. I'll close with this. Romans 1.16. And I won't, I know I'm over time, but take a few seconds on this. And, and literally, I mean seconds. Romans 1.16. <clears throat> It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the power of God unto salvation. And the first Corinthians says, It's the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. See? Why? Because God's in the salvaging business. It's the power of God unto salvation. So it's the preaching of the gospel. 
will salvage you, number one, from going to hell, and number two, if you follow up and you live for God, it's going to salvage your life from being wasted in sin where you can be used of God. God can convert you over to being used by Him instead of just a tool in the de devil's hands all the time. So let's be a salvaging church. Let's be a recycling church. Let's be the trash can of some church that's pharisaical and throws people out. And by the way, sometimes they throw people out on false accusations. A church that does that is probably not going to be honest with themselves, and probably the pastor himself is harboring sin, and he's covering it up. Guaranteed, because Romans 1, chapter 2 tells that. Thou art inexcusable, O man, if thou condemnest the things that thou, that the things that thou condemnest, thou doest thyself. I know, I know I butchered that quote, but that's what it says. Anytime somebody accuses somebody, and not in a humble manner, but in anger, wrath, ah! And you can guarantee by the authority of the Word of God, they're doing the same thing and just covering it up. So let, let's, let's, be, let's, be, let's be new lumps, constantly going to God and getting confession of sins. And let's welcome those who are struggling with sin. And let's say, why do we exhort one another? Why? To encourage one another. And exhort me to call near. Get people to come near to you. Call out to people. Get them to come near to you. If you're right with God, you want to get them to right with God. Exhort each other daily while it's called today. That's how we be new loves. Encourage each other to, to say, get fresh forgiveness. And, uh, and let's, re let's be in the recycling business. So let's pray. Father, I pray that you bless the message to our hearts. Lord, thank you for salvaging my life and saving me. Thank you for salvaging not just my soul, but my life, I, who knows what I would have turned out to be if I had not followed you and I did not have a pastor who looked past my faults and, and preached hard and preached strong but loved me, chose me and wanted me there and wanted me to grow. God, help us not to become Pharisees where we expect people to live up to our standards or to our level that we've arrived at without being patient with them. Help us to be the kind of church where people can come and learn and grow and no clicks and find, wow, a church with no clicks. Wow, amazing. May it be so for the sake of those that you want to recycle. Use us in your process, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.